Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Natalie Arsenault. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Latin American Studies, and I'm pleased to introduce our first presenter this morning, Reese Erling. Reese's history in journalism goes back over 40 years. Today, he works as a full-time freelance and broadcast reporter, filing for National Public Radio, CBC Radio, and Global Post, among others. Reese won top honors from the Society of Professional Journalists in 2012 for his radio documentary on the Syrian Uprising. Reese has published several books, the most recent of which, Syrian Uprising, Assad, the Rebels, and U.S. Policy, was published in 2014. Please join me in welcoming Reese for his presentation on youth and political arrest in Iran. Um, I hope you'll bear with me. I uh, just had back surgery three weeks ago, so I'm recovering, and I very much want to talk with all of you, but I'm just going to sit down somewhere, and hopefully you can come over and talk afterwards. Let's try and get this again. Um, okay, so I'm going to start. Uh, I had a big problem when I was in Tehran with Sean Penn. And the problem was he had contacted me several months before, because I had been to Iran before. And he wanted to visit Iran, not as a movie star, but as a journalist, to report on what he saw and what the reactions of the ordinary Iranian people was to what was uh, US policy at that time. This was 2005. And so I said, sure, I'll, let's go. I'll set up interviews. And he uh, kind of tagged along to various interviews that I was doing for the presidential elections at that time. But we also covered a women's demonstration in front of the University of Tehran. And that's where this problem arose. Because he was filming, uh, and I was there with my radio gear and doing some print and photography stories, of uh, using, shooting photos. And we were uh, interviewing the women, and suddenly a plainclothes cop came out of nowhere and started dragging Sean off. And this is where the problem arose. Because should I go with Sean to make sure he was OK? Or should I stay and cover the story? Because the cop, in taking him away, was ignoring me and allowed me to stay. So Sean Penn's story. Sean Penn's story. <laughs> the journalists in the room will know the answer to that. You do, do, you do the story. Uh, and Sean did understand, although he stopped talking to me. Uh, no, what really happened was, <laughs> that was fake news. What really happened was, that I, I knew, first of all, he was not in any physical danger. Um, they, and they didn't know who he was, actually. Uh, they were just kind of dragging off anybody who was trying to record the scene. And our fixer translator was with him. And she was going to be a much more help speaking Farsi and be able to take care, of, get, take care of him. And that allowed me to go to cover the story. So it was not really a one or, or the other. It was, uh, and he was safe. In fact, he had to leave the demonstration because so many demonstrators recognized him. He was becoming the focus of all of the attention and not the people doing the demonstration. Uh, and that was something we actually uh, discovered in the course of the trip. Uh, as the word got out that he was in Tehran, uh, and there were more and more people who wanted to, every night at the hotel, the, there was people crowded into the lobby, um, uh, sitting in the restaurant, just hoping to get a glimpse of him. We had to, in some cases, come back at 1 in the morning in order to vo avoid the crowds that were gathering at the hotel. But it was a very successful trip. Uh, and if you ever want, to, ever want to see it, he wrote up a series of five stories for the San Francisco Chronicle, which uh, at that time got the largest number of hits of any stories they had ever had in the history of the newspaper. Um, and they're still there if you ever really want to check out uh, his uh, perspective on uh, Iran. And um, we, some people have asked, well, where do you come up with your story ideas? Uh, in this case, it was pretty simple because there was an election in Iran, and you want to cover it was the first time that Ahmadinejad uh, won uh, for the presidency, and of course he then served a second term as well. Um, but I also uh, get tips from people from Iranians who are uh, active in, the ex in exile, who know what's going on in Iran. Of course I read the daily uh, New York Times, uh, Wall Street Journal, and the Chronicle in San Francisco to get ideas from there. So uh, I get my story ideas from a variety of folks, uh, sometimes uh, sparked by an article that I think is not really doing the right, uh, it's an interesting topic, but they're not doing it from the right angle. Uh, in other cases, it'll be just brand new stories that nobody has ever thought of. So on a recent trip to Iran, my last trip to Iran, by the way, I've been there about 10 times. My last trip to Iran was in December of last year, and I noted that there was a decrease in smoking in the times I had visited. So I thought, 
Well, I'm gonna, and I knew there had been an anti-smoking campaign. So I wanted to, I, I looked it up. Nobody had ever done, as far as I could tell in English anyway, a story about the anti-smoking campaign. So I found, I got to Iran and I found the anti-smoking Ayatollah. And it was a great story. It was this guy, he was an Ayatollah, looked just like Ayatollah Khomeini with the, with the long white beard and the turban showing, indicating that he was a descendant of Muhammad. And um, he was on a big anti-smoking campaign uh, and had been for 30 years with varying levels of success. Anyway, if you're interested in that, you can, you can Google that one as well. Um, so I have been uh, a freelance journalist now for over 40 years. I write for NPR, for uh, CBC in Canada, and I have in the past for BBC, uh, as well as um, for print, such as uh, Foreign Policy, uh, the, the web pages of PRI and uh, various folks. So I do print, still photography, radio, and a little bit of video, and you'll see some examples of it in a moment. And that, that's the life of the freelancer now. It used to be you could do one of those, and now you pretty much have to do all of them. You have to have the skills, at least, to, rudimentary skills to be able to do that. And um, it, it's good in the sense that um, uh, you have a lot more people available, uh, a lot more media available, a lot more people doing stories. It's bad in that you can't do all of it well. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do radio print photography and video, I, I know because I've tried. Um, and you can't do, you have to pick some of those for the various, of the various stories. Um, so uh, again, if you want to check out some of my Iran articles, researchlik.com, my web page, is organized by country. So if you're interested in Yemen or Egypt or uh, Venezuela, any of the places, just click on that and there, all the Iran stories are, are there. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the youth situation in Iran and the youth rebellion that's really taking place. Uh, in December, I was there just a matter of days prior to the big uprising. You may remember there were big strikes and rallies uh, in the end of December, beginning of January of this year. Uh, there were thousands of mostly working class young people. They rallied in 80 cities. Uh, in some cases, they burned government buildings. And there was, it was a spontaneous anger at the, the fact that, in many cases, wages hadn't been paid for months. Uh, there were layoffs due to privatization. The big demonstration, some 5,000 arrests and uh, roughly and 25 killed in the process of those uh, week, 10 long, uh, week to 10 days. And the demonstrations were an indication of a much wider economic and political set of problems uh, by a repressive authoritarian regime. Uh, there was 10% inflation. 29% youth unemployment, a 33% drop in the real, that is the lo local currency, a drop up to, to the dollar. So imagine, uh, to make an analogy here, if you, you have your savings account and suddenly it was worth one third less than what it was the day before. Uh, and so everything that you, from paying rent to buying gasoline, it was a third more expensive. You can imagine what kind of impact that would have on ordinary people. Um, so I always like to interview people as, uh, uh, on the street so it, it can, the, the uh, interviews can't be manipulated. If you go see an official government spokesperson, uh, you know, they're going to tell you what's the official line. But if you stop people on the street, which you can do in Iran still, uh, you're much more likely to get uh, uh, diversity of opinions. And if you talk to enough people in enough neighborhoods, so I would always go to North Tehran, which is the kind of fancier upscale neighborhood. They literally have Mercedes, BMWs, and Lamborghinis on the street. Um, and I would go to South Tehran, which is where the working class folks are. And again, stop people at random on the street and ask them, what do you think about current government policy? What do you think about current uh, Trump's policies? And you'll see some examples of that in the video in a moment. Um, and the Overwhelming opinion, so this was in the context of these demonstrations, um, that uh, Trump administration expressed its solidarity, like the Iranian people need that. Um, and overwhelming opposition to what Trump was doing. Uh, this was before he broke with the uh, nuclear accord, which I'm gonna talk some more at later. But even up to that, they were, were, the US was already imposing new sanctions on Iran. And there was a great deal of anger. And the theory in Washington, at least among some folks, some supporters of the Trump administration, is that 
if you put enough pressure, economic pressure, through these sanctions, it will make the people of Iran angry at their own government, and they will overthrow it and install a pro-US regime. That's literally what people like John Bolton and some of his other advisors believe. Um, the reality on the ground, you spend 10 minutes talking to anybody in Iran, and you realize what a bogus theory that is. When, you know, if you're being put the screws on you by these economic sanctions, you get mad not at your own government, you get a, at the, mad at the people turning the screws, the Trump administration. And that's just overwhelming. It's obvious uh, when you travel in Iran and do any kind of serious reporting, but somehow in Washington they live in this other world uh, where their ideology leads to reality rather than the other way around. Um, so let's, at this point, where is Farid with the video? Okay, well, let's play the video and then we're going to talk some more about the uh, nuclear accord. So I shot this as part of my uh, activities for the Pulitzer Center. My name's Reese Ehrlich, and I'm here on assignment for the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. We're standing in front of the famous Tehran Bazaar. On my last trip, I stopped to ask people what they thought about the nuclear accord. I'm back to find out what they think about Trump's latest policies. For this reason, upon taking office, I've ordered a complete strategic review of our policy toward the rogue regime in Iran. When reporting from Iran, I always like to do random interviews with ordinary people. That's how I met Masoud Nashabegi, who sells textiles in the bazaar. What do you think of Trump's policies now? Perhaps what should we do now? He only thinks of himself and he wants to be in full control of all the countries in the world and he has an old animosity uh, with Iran. Virtually every Iranian I interviewed condemned Trump's policies and expressed anger that, despite having a signed nuclear accord, the U.S. is imposing new sanctions that hurt the economy for ordinary people. Just before what would have been the total collapse of the Iranian regime, <laughs> University of Tehran assistant professor Fouad Zadi says Iran has held up its end of the nuclear agreement. Iran disabled a nuclear reactor, shipped enriched uranium out of the country, and restricted its production of nuclear fuel. International weapons inspectors have reported numerous times that Iran is adhering to the agreement. But the Trump administration continually imposes new sanctions on Iran. So a lot of people in Iran are asking, you're getting sanctions before the agreement, and you're getting sanctions after the agreement. So what's the use of accepting what the U.S. wants you to accept. U.S. sanctions have hurt Iran's economy, but so has Iranian government corruption, mismanagement, and misallocation of funds. Tens of thousands of mostly young workers demonstrated against the government starting in late December 2017 and lasting into January. Electrician Arya Khosravi says the government wastes billions of dollars on Middle East wars, money it should use to create jobs at home. Well, I think it's uh, the fault of our own politicians with uh, creating tensions and the issues with Palestine and Syria and Iraq. Many Iranians are critical of both their own government and the Trump administration. Back at the bazaar, I asked textile salesman Nasha Begi if he thinks Trump will pull out of the nuclear agreement. He says the five plus one countries, Britain, France, Germany, Russia, and China, have also signed the agreement, so the U.S. will have a hard time pulling out. Well, if he does, it's to his own disadvantage because uh, uh, it will just show all the European nations that he is an untrustworthy uh, character. For the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, I'm Reese Irwin, Tehran. So, 
what you saw in the video uh, and has subsequently happened after the video and the December trip, of course, the Trump administration announced that they were actually pulling out of the deal. And if you read some of the mainstream media, you get the impression that this was a deal between the US and Iran and that Trump was pulling out. In fact, it was an agreement among seven countries, including uh, the ones listed on the video, uh, Britain, France, Russia, China, Iran, and the United States, and uh, Germany, so seven. And it was uh, not simply an agreement among those countries, but it was a formal resolution passed unanimously by the UN Security Council. Uh, and so by pulling out, the Trump administration was not simply pulling out of a deal with Iran, but with all of those other countries and a, a going against a, a, US, a unanimous UN vote. Now think of all the times when the US wants to attack somebody, like Syria or criticize Iran, and they point to a, a UN resolution. Oh, this country is breaking the U international law. They're violating the UN uh, resolution. Well, it's the US, when the US does it, somehow that gets downplayed or ignored. Uh, I'd love to see an article, every article that appears in the mainstream press say, President Trump canceled the nuclear accord, which had become an international law when voted unanimously by the UN Security Council. What if every time that issue came up, you included that sentence? Would people have a different opinion? Uh, and that kind of repetition is indeed done when it's against an enemy. Think of Maduro in Venezuela. Think of Kim Jong-un in North Korea. The evil dictator oppressing his own people, comma, said today, right? So you have a, a definite uh, different standard, shall we say, in uh, media coverage. Um, the uh, situation today is basically the hardliners in Washington, people like John Bolton and Pompeo, who is now the Secretary of State, formerly head of CIA, uh, have adopted this line that they've actually advocated for some years. I've been back in Washington. I've interviewed folks with this opinion who now are suddenly, who are out in the wilderness because their views were considered so far out. Uh, today are now have the ear of the White House and of Trump. Uh, and their theory is you put enough pressure on Iran and it, the situation will explode. And you particularly exploit the grievances, the legitimate grievances of the minority peoples in Iran. You think of Iran as being Persian. Uh, or indeed, some folks who live here, Iranian Americans, will call themselves Persians, not Iranians. Well, the Persians are the largest ethnic group in Iran. But you have Kurds and Baluchis and Arab Iranians that live in Khuzestan, which is an area down in the south of Iran near the Iraqi border. So you really have a sizable number of ethnic minorities in Iran all of whom have legitimate criticisms and concerns about policies by the, adopted, by the central government. For example, are they allowed to <clears throat> learn in their own language? Uh, are they taught in the schools their own culture and history? Uh, there's a lot of these issues, and legitimate ones. And occasionally, you'll see demonstrations or um, even mass uprisings in the case of the Kurds. Uh, but the US seeks to exploit those differences, not with an idea of actually helping the minority peoples, but as using them as a tool for US foreign policy. And they will be used and tossed away uh, as needed by, uh, as the whims of Washington go, not having anything to do with the actual human rights of those minority peoples. Um, how do we bring all of these kinds of issues, some of which are quite complicated, to students. Uh, I taught for 10 years at uh, various universities in the Bay Area, in San Francisco area. So it's, I taught at San Francisco State, at Cal State East Bay, used to be at Cal State Hayward. Uh, I taught at uh, San Francisco um, Community College for a little while. And I understand, even at the college level, for, with journalism students, journalism majors, I had to require that they read a newspaper every day, or its equivalent online so that they would stay, keep current with the news. And these are journalism students. So I know people who are not journalism students, it's even a bigger problem. So what I would do is I would require them to read a paper, and I would give them a news quiz once a week to see if actually they had um, you know, actually done it. And years later, when I communicate with some of my students, some of them say that alone was the single best thing that I ever taught them <laughs> to get in the discipline of reading the news every day. 
uh, and that's a skill, and uh, it's a, uh, a lifelong endeavor, certainly if you're going to become a journalist, uh, but uh, just to be a citizen of the United States. So how do you get them interested in the news, um, especially when the foreign news is considered even more abstract than domestic news? Well, let me, I'll give you one example. Uh, one of my students ended up being a teacher at a detention facility in San Francisco. Now, this was 15 to 18-year-olds who were under arrest waiting trial. Uh, almost all of them uh, were accused of being involved in the import-export trade. Um, the, 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 okay, you got that. All right. <laughs> it's not the drug trade. It's the import-export, and they happened to be the ones who got caught. Um, and they were all in like orange jumpsuits, and these were, you talk about a difficult class. You may have had some difficult classes before. I had 10 seconds to get their attention, or it was going to be chaos in the room. I was warned of that by my former student, the teacher. And to make things even more complicated, the class I was supposed to meet with wasn't meeting because too many of them were having, going to court that day. So they put through together another kind of mixture of people that weren't even in the same class. So, like I said, I had about 10 seconds. And this was in the context of the um, 2008 Iraqi um, uh, surge. You may remember that, or it's come, sometimes called the Anfar campaign, when the US had sent in 100,000 troops into Iraq to try and suppress the anti-US uh, rebellions that were going on. And it was all over the news. So I picked a topic that I thought would, people would at least know something about. And they, indeed, they had heard about it. And what they had heard was everything that was coming out of the mainstream media. The, the folks in detention are no different than any others. Uh, and it was what a great success it was and what a great idea it was. And I said, OK, what if San Francisco police came into your housing project, 400 of them, 20, 24 hours a day? That would do a lot to suppress crime in your project, right? The drug dealing the assaults, the burglaries, because there were so many cops, right? That would work. I said, what would you do, being an entrepreneur? What would you do <laughs> if 400 cops came into your neighborhood permanently? Oh, we'd go over to another housing project. And we'd start our business over there. I said, that's exactly right. And that's exactly what's going to happen with the US, because you can't keep 400 cops permanently anywhere. You can't keep 100,000 US troops there. They're gonna, you're going to either lay low, or you're going to go to another neighborhood, another part. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. So from that point, so once they kind of got the analogy, uh, we're off and running. And I simply was responding to their questions about what was going on. And we, I mean, we got all over the map into other countries. And basically, whatever anybody wanted to ask, I was there. If, uh, hopefully, hopefully, I could answer it. So you, you have to have a good background in the topic. You have to be sensitive to the issues that they're interested in, often uh, at least some knowledge of things that are going on currently, and kind of build from there uh, and correct ideas that might be mistaken, um, recognize those issues that are controversial. And you say, well, this is certainly what one view says, but here's another view on that same topic, what do you think? Um, and then it's a kind of a Socratic method, which is that you do a question and answer, and you have to be real fast on your feet to be able to answer as best as you can. Or if you don't know the answer, say, I don't know. That's a really good question. Um, that happened with me on my cab, with my cab driver <laughs> coming in today uh, from the airport. He's Indian. And when he found out I was a reporter and I had been to India we were and Pakistan, we were off and running on what was going on. With it. And he had a much more detailed knowledge of the current elections about to happen in Pakistan. So I was really learning from, from him. So there's nothing wrong with learning from, uh, from your students or from other folks. Um, now, what would an analogy for what's going on in Iran and the JCPOA, the um, nuclear accord, what might that be for today's students if I was coming into one of your classrooms? Um, well, I might say, you know, the NFL and the players actually had a deal on this question of, remember Kaepernick and taking a knee and the fact that a, a number of other players were protesting police brutality and uh, uh, human rights issues. Uh, and they actually had a deal with the NFL to allow them to do that. 
for, for those who chose to take a knee during the, the national anthem. Trump comes in and blows up the whole thing. He rolls a hand grenade into it and says, no, you know, this is being un-American. And suddenly, the NFL changed its view and said, well, sure, if you want to take a knee, you can do it in the locker room before the game. Like, that's some kind of a real alternative, right? Um, but that's an exact analogy of what happened with the NFL and how Trump blew that up. That's exactly what happened with the agreement that had taken several years to negotiate with seven countries. And suddenly, Trump decides to roll a hand grenade into it and destroy the whole thing. That's how I would start out. And then, and to the extent that people knew about the NFL deal, and I hope that would be an analogy that could grab people's attention. Um, and similarly, uh, if, again, if I was just picking a topic in general, not necessarily about Iran, I would pick the issue of separation of families at the border. Because that, that's, people have to have some kind of at least basic knowledge that that's going on. And if there's any students of Mexican background or Central American background in your class, they're going to tell you probably some either firsthand or at least secondhand experiences that they or people that they know have had with immigration. And that actually this is not anything new. It's more intense and more focused. But the idea that children have been separated from their parents has actually been going on a long time, both at the border and, of course, for families whose husbands or fathers or uh, mothers have been arrested um, by uh, ICE and taken away, leaving the family maybe with one um, parent or no parents. And the kids then have to go with relatives or friends or whatever. So on an uh, individualized scale, this has been going on for some time. So I would try to both uh, bring out from people's direct experiences and also what do they see on TV, to what extent is the government propaganda having an impact on them. Well, if these people wanted, didn't want to be separated from their families, they shouldn't have come. So why are people coming? And that you get off into that whole question of, well, some folks are coming for economic betterment. Some folks are coming for, because of uh, fear of persecution and they're seeking Legally, they're seeking uh, refuge, and, and what does that mean? Um, and, and you know, get off and again, listen to what their level of knowledge is about it. Uh, try to pre present other viewpoints. Uh, try to correct um, uh, misunderstandings or misinformation. And where can you go to? What are reliable sources to go to to get more information on this and distinguish between the various kinds of mainstream news? Um, prop, all the way down to uh, propaganda uh, outlets that are intentionally providing misinformation um, in, in the blogosphere and so on. Uh, at various times, I've been attacked by uh, groups like the, um, what at the time, uh, I had no idea what it was, it was Breitbart News. Uh, I had covered Venezuela and had written some stories for CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting, on their webpage that simply presented both the government and the protesters' viewpoints. Uh, and that caused outrage, uh, because at the time, you're supposed to be only supporting the protesters. Uh, and another situation about Iran, I reported on the Iranian Jewish community. Uh, and in it, I said, this was in the context of before the agreement had been signed and the, there was debate in Iran, as there was here, as to whether the Iran should sign the agreement. And I went to, the, there's a small Jewish community, roughly 20,000 Jews who remain in Iran. They have five synagogues in Tehran. They have kosher restaurants. Uh, you know, they, it's by no means freedom, but it's not the oppression that you might suspect uh, the Jews would face in an uh, Islamic state. And more, more importantly, it wasn't a general article about the Jews in uh, Iran, but it was an article about what did they think of the prospects of, do they support the nuclear accord, given the fact that Netanyahu, the prime minister in Israel, did not. Uh, and what I wrote was, the overwhelming opinion was to support the agreement, as was the overwhelming opinion of Iranians in general. The Iranian Jews were no different from the Muslims or Christians or anybody else. Well, that apparently outraged Breitbart News, uh, because they wrote an angry tirade against me, because the article had appeared in the USA Today. And the, uh, they wrote an angry tirade, basically saying, Iran is an oppressive country. Nobody you talk to can honestly express their opinion. Therefore, everything you read was lies. 
it, it, that would, I, I give you an accurate, so you can go online and read the article for yourself, but that's a, an accurate summary of the, there was no research, there was no independent interviews, it was just a, a tirade against me. Um, and I had no idea who Breitbart News was at that time. They had, this was before they became famous and, and, and uh, Trump supporters and so on and so forth. Um, so I wrote a response uh, that got widely uh, disper you know, dis dis distributed. Um, and I bring it up because uh, it's a good way to educate your students to compare different online sources to the same topic. It's a bit more work you know, on your part. But uh, when the students get to a level of under, a basic understanding of what the controversies are, it's good to present uh, the different views and, and let them decide for themselves and encourage them to do their own research. And as we know, learning is maybe 90% motivation. If you can get them motivated, they'll be off and running on their own. You don't have to sit there and think about how they learn a new video game or how they learn a new computer program or a new app. You don't have to sit and hold a class in it. They teach each other, right? And you, you learn by doing. So if you can get them motivated on international topics, uh, they're going to be off and running on their own, and you've got to catch up with them. So I'll leave it at that and uh, open up for, Q and, for questions and answers. Thank you very much. <laughs> questions? Yes? Uh, OK, in going to that country, The question was, how do I communicate with the folks in Iran? Do I speak Farsi? No. Uh, I speak English, uh, Spanish, but that's not a lot of help in Iran. Um, so the, um, you, as a reporter from outside the country, I have to have a fixer translator with me that's assigned through a kind of quasi-government agency. They have about five journalism agencies that, you, uh, that are under the control of the government, although they're not formally part of the government. And these folks will, will write, uh, write up all of the, inter are supposed to be with me at all of the interviews. Uh, and they will write up the content of the interviews for the agency, which then gets passed on to the government. So on the good side, if you've got, and these are all, they're all freelancers. So if they do their job well, they help set up interviews and they do accurate translating. And I record everything anyway, so in case there's ever any dispute, I can go back and retranslate it if need be. Uh, so the good ones are helpful in that regard. And, and they're helpful, you know, I don't know if you've ever tried standing on a street corner and asking people at random. It's not so easy. <laughs> First of all, to get them to stop. And secondly, to talk to an American reporter. And thirdly, to get good, interesting sound bites out of them. So a good fixer will help, will be good at doing that and understand what you're doing and, and do an accurate translation. Um, there are some topics that are sufficiently controversial or some people that I'm interviewing are controversial that I, I just don't have my fixer come with me. I just say, I gotta take care of some other things today or I'm gonna go see some friends tonight or whatever. And so I don't wanna get them in trouble because if I do something that's considered too far out and they were part of it, they could, they could ricochet back on that. I don't want them in trouble. And mainly, I don't want them there. <laughs> so that, that if, you're, if you have some experience operating in Iran, you kind of have this narrow line, and you hope you don't step over it. But you, like you know, reporting on some of those uh, attitudes of working people, it skirts up to the, close to the line of what they consider acceptable or not. And they all, you have to get a journalist visa every time you go, and you have to be approved by both the foreign ministry and the Ministry of Culture and Guidance, Ministry of Islamic Culture and Guidance, which is a separate government agency. And if you don't get those two, two uh, permissions, you don't get your visa. And, so, and that's in the back of the mind of every reporter, which is, if I want to come back, how far can I go in my reporting this time? And you have to basically, uh, the way I figure it is, I can't worry about whether I'm going to get my next visa. I have to report accurately on what's going on. And if that means I can't come back, it's not the only country I can't come back to. <laughs> let's, put it, let's just put it that way. I won't name them, but they know who they are. <laughs> yes? Um, what was um, your understanding what happened to uh, Jason and I were residing? Oh, he was. Um, well, when he was arrested, because I know he 
We did the interview for a special show was before, I think it was like six weeks, or maybe eight weeks after we did the interview. Uh, then he was, um, the, the, the news was just, I'm not sure, um, any other information you have or what else would your uh, so he asked about Jason Razayan. His name has kind of been changed to Jason Razayan for popular purposes, but it's actually Razayan. He's an old friend of mine, actually. He he worked on my. He was going to be the researcher on my book, although he lost out to somebody else. But anyway, we go back many years together, and he was a Washington Post correspondent in Iran who was arrested. And he mentioned he had done. He was a fixer basically for the Anthony Bourdain special on Iran, which was very good. If you haven't had a chance to see it, uh, go back on YouTube or wherever it is. It's quite. Through talking about food, he gives you a lot of insights as to what's going on in Iran. And Jason was a good part of that. I don't think that's the reason he was arrested for that particular one. He had written some articles that were, uh, I mean, this is how screwy things are in Iran. He was actually of the reporting on Iran that was more favorable, less, more critical of the US government and more favorable to Iran than pretty much anything that was being reported out of Iran. And that wasn't good enough because he had some sources in Iran that they didn't like. Um, he never got a, they never tell you directly why you get arrested. It's just, you know, it, you're accused of being uh, a spy. And they, they cooked up some phony evidence and they went through all his emails and f took some things out of context. He actually told me in, after he got out he, the detailed stuff of what they, call, what they uh, claimed. And it was, it was completely, it was worse than bogus. I mean, they, they, they were, had arrested him, they wanted to put him in jail, and so they found a reason. That's what it came down to. He was not a spy. Uh, he was not even writing stuff that was all that critical of the government. But from the standpoint of the, of the, right, uh, the hardline right-wingers in Iran, they, have, they always want to have a certain number of hostages from the US, from Canada, from Britain, who can be used for political purposes later. And that's basically what it came down to. And there still are a number of uh, researchers and academics, uh, Iranian-Americans who are in jail now. He, Iran, Jason, the reason they could arrest him was he was born in the United States. Actually, he was born in San Rafael up north of San Francisco. But his dad was Iranian. So he had Iranian citizenship and he had a dual passport. I mean, he had two passports, US and Iran. So they use the Iranian citizenship to say, you're subject to our laws and we can arrest you arbitrarily if we want to. So far, up till now, they have not done that with American reporters. Well, the, that is non-dual nationals. They have not arrested people like me who have no Iranian uh, citizenship connections. Uh, we'll see if that continues to be. The so they, they have a guy, an American guy, um, who's not. Oh, okay. So who is that? No, uh, he's actually I don't know if he's Chinese American or just. Oh, I yes, you're right. right. That's they, right. And when they released Jason, they also released um, the guy named Matthew. Yes, you're you're right. You're right. That is the first. Uh, these, but they're not technic. They're technically were there as researchers or other. They weren't journalists. Um, uh, I think that's correct. Yeah, I think the Chinese guy I know. Uh, he, he was a ch dual Chinese American citizen, and he was there doing research. Anyway, I, the fact that they haven't done it yet is no guarantee of future activity. <laughs> um, Anyway, so that, I hope that answers your question. Yes, here. Um, I guess my question is by Paul. Uh, I know there's an interest in bringing democracy to Iran, but we know there's a nuclear motive, right? So I don't know what it is. In this case, it's the oil, whatever. But how can we uh, inform our students at the uh, college level to kind of move beyond the official narrative mm -hmm. and to say, you know, um, What's in it for us? Because we're not going to be doing it just because we want democracy. You know, I, I, I am from Guatemala, and you know, 1954, we had a CIA-led coup for democracy, right? And so I'm kind of very suspicious whenever it's all about doing something good. But you also don't want to um, sound anti-American, right? <laughs> Um, well, it's not American, you just want to be American. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, hey, I, I believe that you know, there's no form of patriotism. Yeah. You said that. Yeah. Then mm -hmm. to be, you know, to, to ask in the event. But anyway, um, any ideas? Sure. Any, could everybody hear the question, by the way? Or should I repeat it? Yeah, you heard? Okay. Um, yes, I'm a, well, first thing you can do is assign my book to be in your class. Uh, <laughs> The Iran Agenda today is, will be out in October. 
it's an updated version of my uh, an earlier 10 year ago ver uh, book on that topic. And it goes into great, great detail on exactly that question. What are the real motivations of the US in Iran? But for sure, you can teach it. And why are we very much interested in Iran and not in the Congo? In the Congo, 5 million people died in the two civil wars. How many people here, let alone how many of your students, know there, where Congo is, let alone that there were two civil wars, let alone that there were 5 million people who died? If you want to talk about human atrocities, um, there's no knowledge of it because occasionally you would find newspaper articles. You can go back and find it in the New York Times. But it was not emphasized either in the media or in the uh, US out of Washington. Basically because even though there are lots of natural resources in Congo, it's actually quite resource rich, various administrations have decided the civil war there is too complicated for us to introduce troops, for us to have much impact, so we're not going to emphasize it. Whereas Iran, which has oil, uh, and that's a key element as to why the US is interested, uh, we think we can do something about it. We think there's the potential to overthrow the government there and instituted a pro-US regime, which we saw, you mentioned 1954 in Guatemala, of course, with 1953, that's exactly what the CIA did in uh, Iran, where they overthrew what was actually a democratic government of Mossadegh, where he had freedom of the press and freedom of religion and parliamentary elections, et cetera. And that parliament voted to nationalize the oil that was owned by the British, and that was uh, uh, one resolution too far. And the CIA and the British organized a coup and brought in the dictatorship of the Shah. That history is all there and very much worth discussing. So kind of once you've established the basic facts that people know where Iran is on the map, what the current government is, what US policy is, it's very much worth going into the history and why the US, why, what would motivate the US to be so concerned about Iran versus things in other parts of the world. I think you can teach that in a way that's accurate and um, present, uh, I would do it, I would present the other view and say, oh, well, of course it's not oil. The US does not have an empire like the British or others. It's a, um, a different kind of empire. It's basically what their argument is because we defend human rights and democracy. And what does that mean? And then what do the Iranian people think of? I mean, frankly, when you go throughout the Middle East, the US has done a fantastic job of discrediting the word democracy. Um, because everybody says, oh, the US is for democracy. Look what happened in Syria. Look what happened in Iraq. Uh, if, that's a, if that's democracy, we don't want to have any part of it. Uh, they've done more to discredit it than anything uh, that I know of. Yeah. Yes? Um, I remember on that time, uh, I don't know if this was this year or last year, where um, in Iran there were a few women that took off their veil, and that was looking at that on Facebook. Um, do you have any further insight into that? Um, what happened since? Yeah. Right. Right. I also read an interview, which I can't remember which uh, newspaper network this was, but that was with the king, and he's pretty young, and he seemed to kind of indicate that he's supportive of it. Um, so I was wondering what your are talking about. Are talking about the Shah of Iran, when you say the king? Uh, no, the, I don't know, the new, the, the new or one. Well, there's a son, there's a son of the old shop. Yeah, I believe, the it's, the, I, I believe yeah. it's the son. He's like in his 30s. Yeah, in the Palat. Okay, gotcha. All right, so um, here's what happened. I mentioned those demonstrations that took place at the end of December, beginning of January, uh, mostly working class, uh, 80 cities. Kind of emerging out of that around the same time and then subsequently, there was uh, other women who would uh, take, you know, uh, women in Iran are required to wear the hijab, which is the generic term for uh, Islamic covering. So it can be a scarf, uh, it can be um, uh, various, it can take various forms. You can wear a scarf and a manteau, which is basically like a, a, a raincoat, um, there are various forms. But uh, per it's particularly for middle and upper middle class folks, um, it's considered particular and, uh, and non-religious or um, less religious. Um, it is considered very oppressive to have to wear it, mandatory. And so what they would do is they took off their uh, scarves or their uh, covering, they put it on a stick and wave it like a flag. Uh, and then they would shoot a video of it and po post it online. 
And that really got the government angry. And they would f track down the women and arrested them and so on. And to my knowledge, that's kind of phased out now. It, it had a period of a number of months where people were doing that uh, and then stopped. The thing to understand is that if, even if the um, hijab was not mandatory in Iran, uh, many women would choose to wear it. It's a sign of religious uh, devotion, if you will. And it would be done voluntarily. So it's not like this horrific thing that's imposed completely by the government. The, the objection is for non-religious folks, I mean, remember, if you're Christian or Jew, you still have to wear the hijab, <laughs> um, let alone uh, being Muslim. Uh, so the, the argument is we should be free to wear it or not. And that should be up to the individual woman, not imposed from the outside. Uh, but to be, uh, to be fair, uh, the, f the focus of those, that particular kind of demonstration is often with the, the upper middle and upper class women, uh, those folks in North Tehran. You don't see those, the protests, that particular kind of protest, you didn't see a lot of that in South Tehran in the working class neighborhoods. And uh, regarding the, sh the, son, the Shah's son, I have a whole chapter on, on him in my book too. Um, he is, uh, goes around Washington wearing nice suits trying to raise money. Uh, because his dad was the Shah, and what he wants to do is come back as a constitutional monarch, uh, where you know he is the, the formal head of state uh, with a with a parliamentary democracy. He's not advocating the old Shah system of a dictatorship. He's smart enough about that. But even that in Iran, there's no support for the uh, Pahlavis and bringing back the Shah. The memory is too strong of what his father had done. Uh, so yes, he can wander around Washington and give press interviews. Uh, I spent a whole afternoon with him, uh, but he, he's got zero chance of coming back to power. Let's just put it that way. I have, can I ask another yeah, sure. a comparative question? Um, we've been talking the whole time about, you know, mostly the Middle East or, you know, Iran. Um, if you have any knowledge of, because your friend was half Russian or something like to that effect you had mentioned, um, how would you compare the journalistic type of atmosphere and environment um, first, uh, from uh, between Iran and Russia, do you? Because I remember a few years ago there was one or two reporters that had disappeared. They were reporting on something. And, um, do you have any knowledge? On oh, I okay. Well, you mean in? I'm not sure if you mean foreign reporters or domestic reporters. I mean in in. I'm not sure, actually. Well, for sure, I'll tell you what I do know. I'm not an expert on Russia, although I've, I have reported from there a number of times. Um, for sure, some investigative journalists have just been killed, all right, assassinated. And the suspicion is that the government was responsible. To my knowledge, they haven't proved it, and certainly nobody's put on, been put on trial, or if they were, some people, the shooter was caught, but the people behind the shooter never was. Um, in Iran... There have, if you go back historically, there have been journalists, uh, Iranian journalists arrested. Uh, but they tend to use um, internal uh, censorship is the dominant form. They don't have to kill a lot of journalists um, or, or intellectuals in general. That has been, for certainly has been done in the past. There were some really atrocious cases. But today, um, if you're a journalist working in Iran, you know the limits of what you can report and generally you don't go outside those boundaries. Um, you can certainly criticize anything that goes on in the United States and Trump and so on, um, but you can't criticize uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader. Uh, you can't advocate, uh, for example, that uh, Iranian troops be pulled out of Iraq or out of Syria, you know, because those are legitimate wars. You've been invited in to fight, and you know, they have their own line of propaganda on that. Uh, and you simply don't go beyond that. And if you do, they'll shut down your newspaper or shut down your website. And that still does, does go on. And in some cases, people would be arrested and, and released. Um, uh, it, but it's a very repressive atmosphere if you're trying to report, if you're an Iranian reporter. Yes? Not so much of a question, but I just wanted to add that in order to understand the context, Iranian situation, you have to put it in the context of the Middle East and regional rivalries between Iran, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. It's not just U.S. that is involved in shaping the history. Yeah, 
her, her point was um, you have to put the context of what's going on in Iran and regional rivalry, the, um, Saudi Arabia and Israel, as well as Iran, it's not just the US. That's absolutely true. Um, there is, I think it's a secondary uh, issue, but for sure there is competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia, particularly over uh, who's going to be the leader of the Muslim world. Uh, Iran has built an al alliance with Syria, Le Lebanon, you know, Hezbollah in Lebanon. Um, they support the Houthis in Yemen, uh, and, and the protesters in Bahrain. These are all countries where there's a sizable Shia population. And the Saudis are trying to build an alliance with the uh, Sunni-based countries, which include the Emirates and Jordan uh, and others, and, and had been interfering in Syria a lot, funding uh, uh, um, extremist Sunni groups in Syria. So that rivalry has been going on for some, and of course Israel has its own interests in terms of um, it's uh, keeping down the Palestinians and um, expanding or protecting the Golan, which uh, had been seized from Syria in 1967. Uh, and Israel has been very much involved in bombing and military activities in, in uh, Syria. So yes, for sure, all of those regional rivalries are going on um, in addition to what I mentioned about the US. Yes. Um. Just re remind everyone, or maybe you can tell us, I'm not sure. Uh, when did Iran, uh, was Iran ever under like the British protectorate? And who created Iran's borders? Was that a European decision? OK, unlike the rest of the Middle East, which was drawn up, carved up by the Sykes-Picot agreement after World War I, which is why we have Israel, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Iraq, Jordan, that area. That was carved up directly. Iran was uh, an ancient. Oh, did I say something wrong? All right. Uh, Iran was an ancient empire going back, you know, historically. In fast forward to modern, relatively modern times, um, the Brit. It was a. There was no formal. It was never a formal colony, but the British, starting in the 1800s, exercised uh, uh, a dominance in Iran. Uh, it at various times had a monopoly on. Um, Tobacco, <laughs> they, they controlled all the tobacco sales and there was actually a rebellion. I learned about this in my anti-smoking article in the anti-smoking Ayatollah. <laughs> in the 1890s, there was actually an uprising against British domination and it took the form of uh, uh, stopping smoking because they had uh, control of the tobacco monopoly. Um, it really accelerated in 1907, I think, when they first discovered oil. It was actually the first Middle East oil long before Saudi Arabia or Iraq or any of those countries. Oil was discovered in Iran. And it was by a British company. And it, with a few years later, a number of years later, it became uh, what we now know today as British Petroleum, BP. It was a, a government-owned oil company. So Britain had no domestic oil supplies. They were shifting their entire uh, navy from coal to oil. And they needed a source of oil. And Iran was it. So they, were, they ran into basically as a neo-colony. Um, and the, the borders were those that had been established in the 1800s, more, more or less, that have stayed the same. There was some back and forth with neighboring countries. But um, they, it was not directly carved up, as was the, the other countries in the Middle East. And then by World War II, the British installed the Shah, the current uh, Pahlavi dynasty, uh, in the 1920s because they didn't like the previous parliamentary government. And then in World War II, they ousted the Shah because he was considered pro-German, uh, the, the guy named Reza Shah. And the uh, Mohammed Pahlavi, the guy who we knew as the Shah up in through the 1970s, came to power. All this was done through British manipulation. So the British had a, a tremendous, basically a neo-colonial uh, rule of Iran all the way up to 1979. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have questions about um, your entry into journalism. What motivated you at that time? And then, like, I would imagine in recent years, I, I don't know, has it changed? How has it changed? Well, I had a very unusual path to journalism, shall we say. Um, I had organized a very big anti-Vietnam War, anti-draft demonstration in Oakland uh, in 1967 called Stop the Draft Week. And I was a UC student. And we organized one of the big rallies the night before on the campus and then went down to downtown Oakland, 
I don't know why they were upset, but we shut down the entire city for a week uh, in protest of the Vietnam War and the draft. And uh, the university under, was under tremendous pressure to uh, do something, right, and, and crack down on the students. So I was one of the students who got kicked out for organizing the demonstration. Uh, I, the formal charge was uh, um, using a bullhorn at two in the morning on campus. <laughs> that, was, that was a real dangerous felony. Um, and so I was kicked out and I had no, uh, you know, I had no marketable skills. I think I was a sophomore at that point, uh, young kid. But there was a magazine called Ramparts Magazine, which was the leading investigative journalist magazine of the country at the time, kind of like what Mother Jones is today, if you're familiar with that. And um, they gave me a job as a late night Xeroxer and typist, a job which thankfully no longer exists. Uh, <laughs> but it's basically I would come in in the night and retype the stories that the journalists had worked on so there was a clean copy for the editors the next morning. All this, of course, is now done by computer. Uh, and the Xerox machine was this enormous thing, about three times the size of this, and you had this green light that's flashed out, and all oh, the memories. Anyway. Um, they, uh, I was a typist and Xeroxer, and then they made me a, a researcher on the spot when I came up with some research for them. And then I, I went to Cuba and some other places, and I learned to write journalistically. Uh, and I learned on the job. That's what it came down to. I had no, never taken a class in journalism, never. I was interested in it. And it turns out, having been an activist, I understood kind of what a good quote was because I had been dishing them out. So I just reverse engineered it and said, oh, well, that sounds interesting. I'll include that in the article. And then the editors would take my jumbled stories that had good information in it. I could actually save some of them from the old days. And I realized, oh, I kind of had figured this out instinctively, but had no idea what to do with it. So they would go into the other room, come back 20 minutes later, and it was a transformed story. And hey, this is really good. Who wrote this? You know? <laughs> and they did that once or twice. And I kind of figured out I, what they had done to change it. And I picked it up. And, I can do that today for other folks and pass it along. So that's how I learned journalism. Uh, and then I learned radio journalism the same way. I was working for the Christian Science Monitor as a freelancer, uh, doing a lot of foreign reporting. They started up a TV and radio network, and they taught me how to do radio. Uh, and then later I did the same for video and online, and um, good journalism is good journalism. What has changed? Um, it's good news and bad news. Uh, there certainly is a crisis in the business model for journalism. Uh, print, you saw how many people get their news from print. I used to freelance for four or five daily newspapers. Zero takes stuff now. Uh, they have no room for freelance stuff, basically. Uh, on the other hand, there's more media out there than ever before in the history of the world. And it's mostly online. And some of it actually pays. Ha! Huh. What, an what an intriguing idea. Uh, so I have actually managed to find new, all kinds of new folks to write for, uh, foreign policy, Politico, which you're going to hear this afternoon from some more folks, um, uh, Global Post when it exists is now PRI, and everybody has a web page. So I can write a story for radio, write a different story for the web page, and get paid twice, and then get paid for the photos. Uh, so it's a new world. Um, it's, uh, don't believe all the stories about how great things were always in the past. Everyone lo loves nostalgia. You're going to tell your students about how great it was to be a teacher back in the decades, right? And <laughs> although at the time you didn't think so. <laughs> uh, same thing with journalism. You know, it's changing. Uh, it's, some of it's getting better. You just adapt to the new, t to the new changes. Yes. Uh, I, no, let me, you know, I haven't called on you before. Yes. This will be our last question for now. Oh, gotcha. Um, what can you say about objectivity? How do you monitor and filter your own biases? What do you say about objectivity and how do you filter your own biases? Um, Are there any facts? Is there any truth? Yeah, is there any truth? Um, okay, I taught journalism. And uh, I, I'm intimately familiar with the, with the concepts of what it's supposed to be. So you're supposed to be accurate and um, objective. And by that, the way it's officially defined is you're supposed to be new, objectivity means neutrality. So in the simplest of cases, the president says something, you report on that, and then you report on the president's critics. Or, you know, a local issue, same kind of thing. I think there actually is something called objectivity, but it means being truthful. And that's not necessarily being neutral. Um, so 
when I approach a, co a, a story, I very much pay attention to how the mainstream media has reported it, but are there hidden biases in there? Too often in foreign reporting, they're not looking so much as the facts on the ground in that country as they are as how it's being interpreted in Washington. So you get in Iran, and let's use the example of Iran, um, you very rarely get the viewpoint of ordinary Iranians. You get the viewpoint of Washington, the debate in Washington about how to deal with the evil people running Iran. Um, and so I try to write my stories in a different way, the different approach. I like to think of them as objective in the sense that they're truthful. How do you know if something's truthful? A uh, rule of thumb is five years from now, can I go back and read it and say, given the information that I had at the time, did this story turn out to be truthful? Would I put this in a history book as being accurate, not only accurate, but truthful? Um, that's not the, the criteria that's used by most reporters. Uh, most reporters say um, it's neutral, and new by neutral they mean it represents both sides of the debate in Washington which is a very narrow definition of, of, of neutrality and of objectivity. Um, I have lots of debates with my reporter friends on this topic because I'm definitely out of the mainstream on that. Uh, you're officially, you're supposed to set aside your biases and report neutrally on what's going on. And I would argue that's not what they're actually doing. Does that answer your question? All right. Uh, Reese is going to be around for yeah. the rest of the morning, the Friday afternoon, but uh, let's